We're here to talk with Janice Ian. She is, of course, a composer, a uh, performer, an author, and is coming to Rutgers to do all of this stuff <laughs> for a while. And um, it's, it's really quite a thrill. The particulars of this, and then I don't have to look down, is that she's giving a concert on Friday, June 2nd. That's part of it. Correct. And then another part, as if that were not exciting enough, teaching sort of what can be considered a master class as part of the overall uh, Rutgers New Brunswick Writers Conference. That's correct. And that's on the third and fourth. So there's two different things that Janice Ian is doing here this weekend that she doesn't normally do here. So, and correct. So, and so we're here to talk about you. So first of all, um, actually, before I even get to the first question, the whole idea about students and interested people in the community getting to learn from you in terms of writing. What sort of writing are you teaching them? I don't think you can teach people to write. You are either have the gift. So don't go. Yes, yeah, so don't go. Yeah. <coughs> um, no, you have the gift or you don't. But what you can teach people is uh, to avoid the mistakes you've made, and I have certainly made my share, to use their imaginations, to not be afraid of the stories they hold inside themselves. Uh, that sounds like a cliche, but I think it's really important because the worst thing you can do as a writer is edit yourself too soon, as I'm sure you well know. Yeah. I'm not going to edit myself here too soon, but I am going to say in terms of framing, uh, most people first became aware of you as an artist uh, with a song called Society's Child uh, back in... Uh, 1965, 66. Yeah, when you were very young. I was 14. And then you jump forward to about 10 years ago and you use the same title for your mm -hmm. autobiography. Yes. And uh, that covers a all the A multitude of sins. But I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I have to tell you, because we are here to talk about a writer's conference, is that uh, I was, this is almost an insult to say, how impressed and surprised I was by what a well-written memoir it was. Not just that it had all this interesting stuff in it, but that it was written so well. Well, thank you. I think that it's very easy if you're born with a lot of talent in one of the arts. And I say in all humility, I was born with a lot of talent in music. I started writing songs when I was 12. I got published when I was 13. I started recording when I was 14. Uh, it's extraordinary to me looking back that a 14-year-old could write Society's Child. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't extraordinary to me when I wrote it. The danger is that you're born with so much talent in that one area that you become monochromatic. And fortunately for me, my parents had great bookshelves. So I grew up reading great writers. And I was always surrounded by people who loved the English language. But writing poetry or writing for a musical ear, and you also write science fiction. They do, and then, not very well. But... but and you have written, I mean, really, because I, I want to talk a little bit about how good this memoir is and Thank some you. of the things. But, I mean, these are different muscles. They are different muscles. And I think that I started learning that when I was fortunate enough to uh, have an editor named Judy Weeder at the old Advocate magazine hire me to do a monthly column. Oh, yeah, columnist. I forgot columnist. I did columnist yes. for 10 years. Yes, and that, which is deadlines, and it, inescapable deadlines. 1,000 words a month, yep. plus or minus two. And my job was to be the resident iconoclast and say things that were funny about being gay at, because it was the age of AIDS. It was so serious. So I would write articles like um, Gay Chic, A Contradiction in Terms, <laughs> uh, or Mr. Stiffy Takes a Walk, or things like that. And I just had a great time. But it was very good training because Judy really taught me you have to present your case. And you have to present it in a way that I call it a beach read. Stephen King to oh. me is the king of beach reads. You sit down with a good Stephen King book and, or Grisham, mm -hmm. and at their best, you can't stop. The Color Purple, I, I started at 9 one night and I finished it at 5 the next morning. A good beach read is one that you don't want to put down because you've got to find out what happens next. So what's the discipline 
is there a different discipline to writing something longer as opposed to a thousand words or as opposed to working on a lyric mm. uh, when you're mapping out something like a memoir? Uh, I think it's easier in some ways, David, because you don't have the, the tightness of a song. In a song, usually you're shooting for three to five minutes. You've got to tell the entire story, give mm -hmm. the listener an idea of the background of all of those characters, give them a sense of belonging to those characters and living with their lives. In a book, you've got all that room. So it's intimidating at first, but I know a lot of writers. I had some very good advice, and one of the pieces of advice was take it in pieces. Don't think I've got to write 140,000 words. Think I've got to make 2,000 words today. Yeah, I had to learn that. That's a tough lesson. <laughs> yeah. But do you, do you write a column or do you write a chapter of a book at the same time of day and in the same place that you would write a song? Or are these different I entities? I don't know about you, but for me... I don't write um, songs, so that's easy. But for me, writing takes two forms. There's the one form, which is in Nashville, for instance, as a songwriter, you get up, you have breakfast. Maybe you have breakfast with your co-writer if you're co-writing. And then at 10 o'clock, you sit down and you work. And you work. And I did the same thing when I was writing my book. I did the same thing with articles. I'm doing the same thing with my current projects. I sit down and I work. Um, Mercedes Lackey says, sit butt in chair and write. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> advice. But the other is, when I'm driving and I suddenly think of something like, wow, what a great title, Summer in New York. And it evokes all these memories and my brain starts working on it and next thing I know I've got a melody. And then I race home because it feels like a jinx if I don't grab it right away. It feels like I'm, um, like I'm being untrue to my talent. Pick a specific, and I'm not gonna ask for your most famous or... or oh no, that's easy. No, okay, go. So I learned the truth at 17. I was sitting at my mother's dining room table. Uh, I, was, I had had to go back to live with her because I was broke and I was waiting to make an album and I had no money. So I was living off her and I felt the least I could do was write songs. But I was taking a break and I was guitar in hand playing this little samba figure of ding, 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 reading the New York Times Magazine. There was an article by a woman who had thought that when she came out as a debutante, everything would be great. And it wasn't. And it was, I learned the truth at 18. Mm -hmm. was, I learned the truth at 18 doesn't scan. I learned the truth at 17 scanned, off and running. And then there was, you wrote that there was also a second connection early on that made you feel like you had that song, that it wasn't just the first line, but it was the rest of the first verse. Well, it's my life. I mean, I was the kid that never got picked for the school games because I was too short and I would fumble and I couldn't see that well. Uh, I was the kid that they asked to stand in the back of the chorus and mouth the words because my voice didn't sound like everybody else's. I was totally an outsider. And I think now, as an adult, that Artists are born outside. We're just born there. And we spend our entire youth trying to get in. And then at some point in our lives, we go, you know what? It's okay to be outside. Somebody's got to be out here. We're talking about the song, of course, At 17, which I've brought a clip that we will see in a, a few minutes. Cool. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, two of the things that I learned from your memoir about that song one is that you said when you started to write it, you never, you intended to never perform it. Oh my God, it's an excruciating song to sing, especially then. I wrote it when I was about 23. I was still so close to those feelings and I, I, I sang it with my eyes closed for months because I was so convinced everybody in the audience would be laughing at me. And so you're not talking excruciating in terms of, of physically being able to hit the notes. No, you're talking about the so emotional painful. Oh, yeah, you're it. talking about having a ravaged face. You're talking about nobody wanting to date you. You're, you're confessing all of the things that we keep hidden when we're in school that we try to brush off. I mean, it's a, it's a very... The hardest thing about that song was not lying. And I remember thinking when I hit the third verse, I can't lie now. I have to just continue being honest. And I had no intention. I was That and the song Stars, I was going to sing them 
one time when I got to play Carnegie Hall, and that was going to be it. It was my mother who convinced me otherwise. Well, the, uh, the other thing from the memoir, and it had never, I'd, I'd heard that song like many people have dozens and dozens of times, probably many more than that, and it had never occurred to me that you had a spot in the song where it was hopeful. Well, Billie Holiday had the greatest answer when somebody said to her, all your songs are so depressing, and she said, oh, baby, they all have hope. And I think that that's what I try to do, too. Um, with At 17, the unconscious reference is an ugly duckling turns into a swan. That's the storyline. With stars, it's I'll come up singing for you. With Jesse, there's the hope that he will come home someday. They're, they're all open to the possibility of, I don't want to use the word success because that means you're comparing yourself to something, but <coughs> they're open to the possibility of a happy ending. Mm -hmm. And uh, my partner calls it my unprintable Pollyanna self, but I do believe that there are happy endings. So you've already mentioned the word honesty, and I have that in my notes, big capital letters, because <laughs> it's not only in your lyrics, it's in your memoir. And that's where you don't usually find honesty, is in people's memoirs. Yeah. If you've read enough of them, they avoid honesty. Well, the goal is to make yourself look fabulous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, as an artist, I want everybody to think that I'm wonderful. That's my job. But is it, is it either the same discipline, or is that your particular strength or secret to say, if I'm going to do something to my own standards, I have to be honest? I think it depends on what it is. Um, one of the things I try to teach young songwriters and young writers is that there's a big difference between being truthful and telling the truth. I know, that was explain. very deep. Thank explain. You. No, no, explain. <laughs> so Stella Adler, my teacher and oh. mentor. Oh, okay, stop there, yeah. because Stella Adler, I was so surprised that she's, because she's an acting, I mean, she was acting uh, coach. The, the acting the coach. The acting yes. coach, and I, what the hell is she doing in your book? I needed to learn to be comfortable on stage in a way that I was not comfortable. And the generation before mine learned to be on stage from the vaudeville people. So they, they were used to doing three, four, five shows a night, seven nights a week. Um, my generation didn't have any training, and particularly coming from folk music, it was considered uh, tacky at best <laughs> to learn to be a performer. But the older I got, the more I realized there was something missing terribly from my show if all I did was get up and sing. It's a lot to get up and sing. I don't say that there's anything wrong with that, but when you have 60 feet to cover, just standing and singing for two hours gets pretty old. But, but in, the, in the 50s into the 60s, I mean, the Smothers Brothers were able to make a career out of uh, parodying the earnestness of folk singers who, before they would <gasps> sing a three-minute song, would do a seven-minute Explication. I'd like to talk about the war between the roses and the effect that it had on <laughs> modern politics. Yes. Yes. So that's not what you're talking about. No. Stella would say, if you can't speak the truth, shut up. <laughs> and that's a basic acting tenet. If you're not coming from a place of truthfulness in yourself. So that doesn't mean that I can't play Lady Macbeth because I've never worn a crown. Mm -hmm. But that means that I need to know Lady Macbeth inside and out in my imagination. And it's the same as a songwriter. It's the same with any kind of writing. So if I write a song like Tattoo, which is about the Holocaust, there's no way I could experience that. And I don't mean to minimalize it, but I can go to my imagination and say, I know what it is to feel trapped. I know what it is to feel terrified. I know what it is to feel powerless. Not to that extent, not in that circumstance, but I know those feelings. And so I can use those feelings as part of being truthful in the song. So did Stella Adler teach you to be more proficient at writing character songs, or did you have that already? Stella taught me to be more proficient at being an artist. She gave me a vocabulary for being an artist that I had never had. She gave me the sense that I was not alone in the world. She said that so long as there was one artist living, I would always have a home. That is an extraordinary thing to say. 
to someone who grew up feeling like they were the only one in the world. It says something about the importance of art, too. Absolutely. And did her impact on you from teacher to student uh, make you want to be or want to be a different kind of teacher? Well, I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> Stella, and Stella was failing. When we met, I was 33 and she was 83. And when she hit about 87 or 88, she started talking about stepping down. And I remember it vividly. We were sitting after class and talking across the table. And she said, and so, my dear, I am handing you the torch. And I kind of looked at her and I said, what? And she said, you must teach. And I said, no. There is no way. My father was a teacher. My cousins and uncles and aunts are teachers. There's no way. It's not what I do. And Stella said, you must teach. I'm handing you the torch. And I didn't understand for years until Berkeley, Boston, and Pat Patterson there made me come and teach. And I did a week, and I found that Stella understood something I hadn't understood, which was to just teach acting to actors and to just teach music to musicians was not going to be enough in this world. It needed somebody who could cross those lines, who knew a lot of different worlds. And I think that's why she handed it to me. There's one part in your memoir where you talk about she called on you and you didn't want to be called upon. Oh, God. When, which <laughs> probably could have been more than, this could be more than one it's story. It's an entire year. <laughs> yeah, but... but uh, and help me with this, that basically you were explaining in musical terms mm -hmm. what was missing or what was in the pauses. Can you? She was trying to get across to the actors there. Stella's classroom was there were actors in the center, there were observers on the sides. I did a great job the first semester of being an observer and sitting behind some very tall people <laughs> so she would never notice me. Um, because she could be very vicious. I mean, she separated the wheat from the chaff. She would, she gave a girl a dime once, told her to call home and said, tell your mother to come and get you because you have no business here. A paper chase, Professor Kingsfield. That was Stella. Wow. So she was scary. She was scary uh, and wonderful. And she was trying to explain to the actors the notion of a beat, which you have in writing as well. It's it's that the space is as important and more important than the speech. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always tell a novice writer because they're little, 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 little. Yeah. It's 400 pages when you should have three. And she finally, she stopped and she looked at me and she went, you, stand up. And I, I literally went. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, stand up. And I stood up and she said, when you sing, do you sing the notes? And I, I wasn't even thinking. I was so terrified. I said, no, I sing the space between the notes. And she looked at the class and said, she got it. She's not even an actor. What's mm -hmm. wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And we were friends from that day on. Well, it's a great lesson for writing. Period. Too. Any of the arts. There's, where is it? I want to find this in, I don't even need to find it in my notes because I know what it is. Oh, God. It's, it's an example of that uh, where I thought the writing was so good. Where earlier uh, in the book, you talk about finally getting the piano. Oh, my Bosendorfer. Yes. Oh, my your God. Your Bosendorfer. And you describe what you appreciated about that so mm. clearly. It's like later on in the book, you talk about uh, finding a house. I think it was in Nashville, and there was a music room. Uh, a music room. A music that room, the girls room that you knew in. was a music room mm -hmm. the second you walked in it. And these, the way you describe these things, uh, so well written, but then later on in the book to get back to the piano, the Bosendorfer, is mm -hmm. that what it is? It was a Bosendorfer. You have a, a sentence, four words long, I sold my Bosendorfer, yeah. which you needed to do because you were in financial straits at the time and helping with your mother. Yeah, my mother had multiple sclerosis and I was outside of the small social security disability money she got, I was what kept her from eating cat food. And um, I had a business manager who had been my business manager from the time I was 15 who had gone rogue. And I found myself one day with nothing. Uh, in fact, I was in debt over a million dollars to the IRS. And I couldn't send my mother money. And um, 
And so I sold my piano. Sorry to drag that. No, that's too. okay. No, but that's okay. what hit me even harder than the story as you just told it is that... The brevity. Mo yes. Most writers, when they got to that point, would spend a couple of paragraphs talking about what that meant if that would have to you. It. And you just had, I sold, I sold my board and corporate. I'm still in mourning. You know, it's, it's funny. I'm 66, and I have... I'm very fortunate I have so few regrets, um, but I miss my Bosendorfer. That's that and my father's D-18 that came back to me were the only two things that I ever cared about. But that's, that's a choice of writing. Does, are there parallels to that in lyric writing? Sure. Um, Jesse, come home, period. Mm -hmm. You don't say, Jesse, come home because I'm missing you and it's been so long and we lived together for 30 years before this. You just say, Jesse, come home. There's a hole in the bed where we slept. Now it's growing cold. So that's three lines. You've got a person's whole life there. Mm -hmm. I don't say that I did that consciously. That's the talent. That's why I think any good artist stands humbled before their own talent because you're born with that. You work at it and, and you think about it and you, you cherish it and nurture it, but you're born with the sense of it. But it, I think if you look at it, almost any of my writing that's there, less and less and less as I get older because I find myself so <laughs> incredibly uninteresting as I get older. <laughs> yeah, well, you've already disproven that theory, <laughs> no. But when that talent was at its most raw, when you were youngest, when you were writing uh, songs at a ridiculously young age, um, what sparked society's child? Well, I was living in East Orange, New Jersey. We had moved there from New Brunswick, oddly enough. And I was on a bus going to school. So I would have been in eighth grade, I think, or ninth grade. And uh, almost all my friends at that time were black because most of East Orange was black. And I saw a black and white couple on the bus. And they were holding hands and they were oblivious. And the people on the bus were not happy. The whites weren't happy, the blacks weren't happy. So I was seeing society's child in reverse because the parents of my black friends did not want them dating white boys. And yet people were. What made you that observant that young? <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. My parents were very politically conscious. I grew up in a very political household. We were under surveillance by the FBI from the time I remember. But I don't know why I noticed that on that day. You know, Stella used to say, your talent lies in your choices. But that's a perfect example. I mean, that's not a Moon June Crone kind of song. Well, but if you were going to be a folk singer, which is what I was going to be, and you worship Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and Odetta and Buffy St. Marie and Billy Ed Wheeler, then you didn't write Moon Spoon June. It took me a long time to see the value of Moon Spoon June. All right, this is where you get to show off a little bit, because also in the memoir, you you don't drop names like cluster bombs, but <laughs> but you do, you do all of a sudden, oh, there's a Jimi Hendrix, there's a Bob Dylan, uh, there's, you know, even, even places that you played. But these are people in places I grew up with. It, it, who knew that Jimi and Janice would die and become legendary? We, we didn't know. I mean, who knew the Rolling Stones would still be performing? We didn't know. Everybody was just, like Dave Van Ronk said, you know, Everybody was hoping to make 500 bucks a week and quit their day jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the goal. Dylan said that. So if you grew up like me, listening to the Newark Soul radio station that did a folk show once a week under the covers so your parents couldn't hear you because it was after bedtime and you were hearing Phil Oakes and you were hearing mm -hmm. Ed, uh, Eric Anderson, and then I was suddenly among them, that became the norm. So... Broadside Magazine was the first uh, place you were published. I was, yeah. Um, any writer is so excited by the first publication. Oh, my gosh, still, gosh. So do you remember Anytime. Do you remember getting it back? Was it a Mimeo? It what was, was mimeographed, it? and they were living in the Upper West Side, and they were not allowed to be running a business, so Aggie, their daughter, would take out all the copies to the post office in a baby buggy. Oh, I sort of just <laughs> jumped right in. W explain what Broadside... Broadside was a mimeographed magazine that was the first to publish 
oh gosh, Dylan Oaks, me, um, Buffy St. Marie, a host of the, what were considered the vanguard of folk music mm -hmm. at that time. And it was run by two Okies, Sis and Gordon Cunningham and their daughters. And uh, it was very much left. Pete Seeger was one of the founders. And it supported people like me who were living in places where nobody else was listening to that music. Yeah, but not people like you who were, what, 14? How old were you? I was 13, I think. When oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> yeah. To hey, don't that. pick on my age. Yeah. Okay, so 13, and you send away. Most 13-year-olds don't even know how to put uh, something in an envelope and send it off. Oh, I think we underestimate them terribly. I really do. Okay. I think most, once you hit 10 or 11 and you become conscious, you're into a whole bunch of stuff that nobody but your age, age group knows anything about. I mean, b way pre-internet. Because all the 12 and 13 year olds I knew were writing poetry, were reading poetry, were writing to each other, were falling in and out of love. I mean, that's a very, uh, I don't even know what the word is for that age. It's, it's such a blossoming of self. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I had the good fortune that I had piano lessons when I was a kid from terrible teachers, but still. So I could, I saw how they wrote the charts in Broadside, and I copied that and wrote my little song. Um, I still have a draft of the one that I sent in. Um, and I sent it in. You know, I probably asked my parents for a, a stamp or used it out of my paper money because I had a paper route. And then, uh, and then they called and said I was invited to a hootenanny. Which paper? Would have been whatever the record. It's whatever the New Brunswick paper was. Okay. Because girls w couldn't have paper routes, so I paid the guy, the kid who had it. I paid him part of my take to let me take over his paper route. Wow, well, you subcontracted. I was. Sub <laughs> <laughs> that's that's something. I you know I I, I was going to be a veterinarian, and there was this veterinary book I desperately wanted, and it was I remember it was over eight dollars. And in 1964, yeah, it was a fortune. May as well buy a car. Yeah, so I was I was saving so, money for the book. So did you get the book? I now? did. I still have the very. And why vivid are you not a veterinarian? <laughs> it's a Everything good question. else you wanted to accomplish, you've My done. My fallback plan was that I was going to be a vet to make a living, and I was going to do music on the side because you couldn't make a living doing music. So do you have? Do you remember? Do you remember how long it was since you sent sent your song off to Broadside to where? you got back an issue or saw on a newsstand that it was actually printed? Oh, it wouldn't have been sold out? on newsstands. It was like so left. Oh. Just, <laughs> they wouldn't have had it on newsstands. Maybe so in New York. In record stores? Or how, do you, how, do um, you even, how did you even get it? There was, it was the leftist underground, you know? The leftist underground that trickles serious. down to 13? Well, my parents okay. and friends right. from camp. We right, went to okay. Camp Woodland. My dad taught there. Uh, and that was Pete's, Pete Seeger's uh, favorite camp. And then my dad was head of a couple of camps that had all those left red diaper babies, if you will. I mean, we didn't even have Fourth of July. We had Hiroshima Day. You know, <laughs> it's just a whole different way of growing up. <laughs> it was pretty schizophrenic now that I think of it. Uh, I must have sent this song in. I wrote this song in August, I think, or September. So I would have sent it in October or November, and I think I did the hoot in February. Of the next year, the hoot was like a, a hoot nanny tied in to. Yeah, they used to do these great things at the village gate. Art Delugoff would donate one <sighs> Sunday a month, and all these folk singers would come and sing. And so, the first time I was on stage, there was Tom Paxton, and there was Richie Havens, and there was Lou Gossett Jr. Uh, Judy Collins was in the audience. Phil Oakes was there. Eric Anderson. Oh man, for me it was. And you're 13. I was 14 uh, then. No, I think it was 13 and a half then. Yeah. I was, um, if you're still measuring your ages in half, you're astoundingly <laughs> young. You know, that's the point. But, uh, so, when did you physically hold the Mimeo in your hand for the first time? When, when, when were you a published it writer? Well, it must have been sometime right around then. Because I remember I got the copyright notice from the copyright people because somebody told me I should copyright it. And so I got the copyright notice, and that was a huge deal. Still to this day mm -hmm. to me. The copyright office in the United States is a huge deal. Those people have been good to me since I was a 13-year-old writing them letters asking how to fill out forms. Um, and, I, and I still have that copyright. Uh, so you look at it and you go, words and music by, and there's this big red seal on it. 
and it just feels like you're a professional. Mm -hmm. You know, you're... Uh, well, you are. I know. I was. And it was just mind-blowing. <laughs> it was just, look at this. And then, of course, you have to go to school, and they're asking you to do arithmetic. And so you already have um, a hit. Well, I have a, a couple song of years. published. Yes, you have a. You, you have a. You, then you have. Then you have. Then I have what they call a difficult hit. Yes, a, a difficult a hit. A difficult hit. It took a while to get it going, or it took a, well, it, Society's Child was recorded for Atlantic Records, with Shadow Morton producing. There's a span. <laughs> Shadow Morton produces uh, the Shangri Las, doing Leader of the Pack and mm -hmm. Walking in the Sand. Then he produces me doing Society's Child. Then he produces Inagata de Vida. <laughs> and then he goes to the vanilla fudge. I yeah. mean, who which, does that? Yeah, which of these is not like the others? All of them. <laughs> all right. of them. Yes. <laughs> what a wonderful man. Um, we made the record for Atlantic Records, and they gave it back. They said they couldn't put it out. It was too volatile. Actually, Jerry Wexler apologized to me in public years later at the Grammys. I thought that was a stand-up mm -hmm. thing to do. And then they took it to 22 record companies, which was all the record companies there were at the time, and everybody turned it down. And so it looked like it was dead in the water. But People kept saying, away. great record, but can't play it. And then MGM picked it up for a new label, Ver Forecast, which, as it turned out, was, a, um, was intended to lose them money for their taxes. <laughs> so they, they signed everybody in the village that everybody thought would never make money. They signed Laura Nero. Richie Havens, me, all of these people you to lose their money. You were springtime for Hitler. Yeah, it was springtime for <laughs> And then it was, and so then they put it out in summer. It must have been summer of 66. And they put a lot of money behind it, and WOR-FM had just started, mm -hmm. and Murray the K, and they went on it really heavy, and it became a charted song in New York, but no one else would touch it. They put it out again for Christmas, threw money at it, nobody would touch it. And then Leonard Bernstein got it from David Oppenheim, who oddly enough wound up being married to Stella Adler's daughter, speaking of wow. synchronicity. Okay. And David showed it to Mr. Bernstein, and he loved it. And he featured me, um, we taped in March because I was still 15, and he featured me for I think 15 minutes on his television show inside the rock or pop revolution. Mm -hmm. And he really castigated the radio stations. And the next morning, all these stations were calling in apologizing because viewers were saying, what? And it became a hit. But it took it a year to work its way across the country. So it was never number one. It would be number one in Philly, and then it would move over a little east, uh, not east west. a little west. Mm -hmm. And then it would move over a little further west and a little until it finally hit the west coast. So it was a difficult record. But once it, once it was there, um, it did not go away. You, you mentioned uh, WOR. That was just about the time. I think you even mentioned it in the book about freeform radio. It was the first of the freeform radio stations. And can you talk about your perspective about the difference or the importance of hearing so many different types of music oh, on God. one station at the same time sure. versus how you find music today? I think one of the fantastic things about the 60s and the arts was that there was a real cross-fertilization. There was a real sense that Oh, you do African music and you work with Olatunji? Well, I do Scottish bagpipes. Maybe we can do something interesting. <laughs> and there were promoters like Bill Graham who, whether you like him or not, he would put on shows like uh, he did um, the Village Theater, and it was me and The Doors and B.B. King and somebody else. And it was basically, you want to see The Doors? You've got to sit through these other three acts. Mm -hmm. You want to see Janice? You've got to sit through the other three. There was a real effort on the part of radio, on the part of promoters, on the part of artists themselves, to make sure that everybody had as broad an outlook as possible. It was unthinkable that you would only get your news from one source. It was unthinkable that you would say, I only like this kind of music. It was unthinkable to my generation mm -hmm. because there was such a bigger world out there and that was the excitement and I think, personally, that the two main reasons that the music industry has been tanking are that first of all we put out CDs which don't cover the entire span of your hearing 
So your ear keeps trying to fix that and it gets tired more quickly. And second of all, for the sake of sales, we've divided everything into these tiny little niche market genres while simultaneously throwing all the small record company stores, all the small record stores out of business. So we insisted that our audience only listen to a narrow band mm -hmm. and we didn't offer them the kid behind the counter who would say, hey, you like that? You might like this. Right. And in doing so, we're doing a really good job of destroying art in America. So how do you, as an artist who's still recording and even doing her own record label stuff, how do you get the music to the right people and the new people? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, it's very frustrating if you let it get to you because it was frustrating then. I mean, let's not forget that the 60s were also the age of Grand Funk Railroad and the cow sills. <laughs> um, it wasn't all, wow, this is illuminating. I think it's a lot harder now and it's a lot easier now. It's easy because anyone can make a CD. Mm -hmm. $1,000, you're done. It's harder because there's no filtering system. And it's still, in my business anyway, which is now an industry, it's still a world that's very controlled by greed, mm -hmm. of course, money. It was a lot easier when the mafia ran a lot of it. And I say that in all seriousness because you knew where you stood. Um, once it turned into cocaine in the 80s, and it wasn't the artists doing the cocaine, it was the, it was the business managers and the managers and the executives that were running it into the ground. Once it became that, uh, once people started doing all the stupid, stupid infighting and spending millions of dollars, once they brought in bankers rather than people who had wanted to be musicians, couldn't make it and turned into mm -hmm. record executives, it all changed and now it's U.S. Steel. I remember a day when I, I was watching people at Sony and you had the software people here and the hardware people here and the music people in the middle and they were all fighting with each other and I thought, I'm just software now and the only reason I exist is to sell their hardware. That's the only reason that they have music. Mm -hmm. now you think about that. Well, it, it's pretty much a parallel to what's happened with television and what's happened with movies. Yep. You know, it's it's not as pure and you can go back um, I can argue as a TV critic that television has actually found a way to improve but you go to movies and the early 70s is probably the last apex right. and you could almost say the thing for for not the overall history of music but the variety of music and mm -hmm. the availability of music that, that was a that was a golden time. Or <laughs> is it just that at a certain age, I am saying that was the golden time because that was when I was young and receptive and soaking it all up, but it just seems like no, it was there. Yeah, I don't think so. We know that Paris was a golden age for all the arts mm -hmm. at a certain point. We know Greenwich Village was at a certain point. We know Athens was at a certain point. I mean, those, are not, those are not false things. I think it filters across the country, too. We forget... It's easy to forget how wealthy this country is. We forget how much opportunity there is here with our bickering and our infighting. And the generations that come after mine forget the days when there were eight or ten people running for political office and you didn't need billions of dollars to run mm -hmm. when you could actually run a grassroots campaign. Um, Eugene McCarthy. Uh, you know, it, we forget... We forget those things, and, and we allow ourselves, I don't mean to get strident, but we allow ourselves to be manipulated, and that's as consumers as well. If you're going to insist that you get everything tomorrow, that's the world you're going to create. If you want your music to come tomorrow, it's going to be disposable, because music that only takes 24 hours to make is usually pretty disposable. The concert that doesn't require your concentration, that you can watch through your, through your phone, is not a concert. You write about um, a performance, a song, a piece of music that changed you mm -hmm. at around this era that I was surprised by and thrilled to read about. And it was 
I guess it would have been 70-71. It was Vincent. Vincent, a uh, song by uh, Don, McLean. Don McLean. And it, people who, if the name Vincent doesn't immediately bring that to mind, it's the starry, starry night. Starry, starry night. Ain't your palette blue and gray? Colors on a sunny... Yeah, it's a... Uh, <sighs> Why? You, because you, you sort because of... You sort of say that change. You'd already had Society's Child. You'd already written. Yeah, but I wasn't a good writer. Okay, so what did you hear in that song that changed you as a songwriter? Everything I wanted to be. Vincent, there, there are not a lot of great songs. I mean, as, as I get older, I, I get fussier. Um, Moon River is a great song. Uh, Vincent is a great song. Pirate Jenny is a great song. There are few and far between, and they require a brevity. They require a tug at your heartstrings. They require a way of reaching into your heart and grabbing it and holding it and then letting it go with new blood. And that's very rare. It's, it's, we all have songs like, I love to do Ron Ron. That's one of my favorite mm -hmm. songs on earth. It flips me right back to where I was when I first heard it. We all have songs like that. But songs that change your life, that's another thing entirely. Yeah, but it's also like I heard that song when that album came out and absolutely loved it. But so that's it. I, I loved it. But you're not you, a songwriter. Right. So, so I want you to explain to me what difference that makes. Okay, it follows no rules. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus out. That's, forget it. It doesn't follow any rules. And yet it all has a logic that's internal, that's completely its own logic. So it stands alone in that sense. There's a brevity of form. Um, there's an honesty. I could have told you, Vincent, this world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about a, a, an artist who was completely crazy who cut off his ear, who painted landscapes in a way that no one had ever painted, who was completely shut out of this world during his life. And there's McLean empathizing and having not just pity but sympathy for him. There's, there's an honesty and a truthfulness and a truth and a heart to it that is so rare. And it holds from the very first lines to the very last lines. Does the fact that it, he's also singing about an artist that was not appreciated in his own time, is that a subtext that at the time you heard it appealed to you, or was that not Maybe. part of it? Maybe. I was pretty down then. I, I had been, um, I had walked away from the music business. Uh, I had been overdosed by accident, and I had pretty much shattered and was seeing a therapist who was helping put me back together. And again, you're very honest about that period. Well, yeah. It's almost scarily so. Well, when it should be scary. It's very scary to watch the street dissolving. Um, but I wanted desperately, David, to be the kind of writer that I thought I could be, and I didn't know how to get there, and I didn't know any other writers. And so uh, I read a lot of poetry, and I wrote a song a day for a long time. And then I wrote two songs a week, and then I wrote a song a week, and then I said, okay, now I'll write when I feel like it. So I was not writing at that point, but I was listening. And um, I don't think I was feeling so much misunderstood or outcast as I was feeling hungry. I was very hungry. Mm -hmm. And then Vincent... I mean, there were other records at the time that influenced me a lot, but Vincent came along at a time when I was ready to start writing again. And the next hours after I listened to Vincent, I wrote a song called Stars um, in two hours. And the next morning starry, starry I woke night up. to Stars. And, yes. and Stars is also about a performer. I think that every songwriter eventually ends up writing a song about being an artist, just as every filmmaker winds up making a film that has some intangible touching of being an artist. Um, every artist thinks about being an artist and tries to pass on to the, to the other artists what they've learned and what they understand. Didn't you eventually either, uh, 
open for tour with Don McLean? I did. I did. I've known Don since I was pretty young. So were you able to say to him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm sure he's buy read it, it a did million he buy times. It? Sure. Okay. Sure. But, you know, we're, I mean, we're performers. Anybody who tells us we influence them, we're thrilled. <laughs> I would always believe it. So I, I promised earlier in our conversation that I would, I would show and talk about uh, your appearance on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Uh, 1975. 17 You're, was just being a hit. Yeah, right. so it, it, had been, it, it had made the charts right. at 17. But this is... This is not just early Saturday Night Live. This is the no, very the first, one. first episode. Yeah, I watched it for the first time a few years ago because it was live, so I'd never gotten to see it. Uh, and I had forgotten how amazing George Carlin was. Oh, my God, the things he was saying. Yeah, yeah and you know all those commercials that they, well, you must know this, mm -hmm. but um, they couldn't get a sponsor because nobody had done live TV since the old Sullivan show. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't get any sponsors, so they made up their own commercials. And there's that great commercial for the um, arthritis medication where the, you see this woman's hands and she's yeah. trying to open the bottle and <laughs> can't get it open. Yeah, that was great. It was a great show. It's funny because the first one wasn't that well watched, but the second one that Paul was on, Paul Simon, that was the huge mm -hmm. one. It was like the unofficial Simon and Garfunkel reunion. <laughs> yeah. So how, first of all, how scared were you? Oh, I wasn't scared. Um, I was lucky that I'd grown up doing live TV, so it wasn't anything novel to me. The crew were composed of either people who were from The Sullivan Show or who had never done live TV. Most of the actors had never been on live TV. So there was a lot of terror, but uh, uh, George and Billy Preston, who was the other mm -hmm. musical guest, and I... I don't remember any of us being particularly terrified. Now, when you watch that, or at least when I watch that, uh, I'm stunned by how reverent the audience is, how you really draw them in no, with that's, that performance. At 17 does that. that. That's the song. I mean, I, don't, so I, you, I wrote you, it. You, I know, <laughs> but you, you felt that. From, I mean, watching I it on still, TV, sure. I do it, but I mean, I see that. Oh, sure. I feel that, but sure. you, did, you did and you do. There's not a lot of songs you get to be involved with that are magic, um, but at 17 is magic. Stars is magic. There's something about the melody and the way that it goes with the words in that song that sneaks into people, and it's there before they know it, and it feels so familiar, and yet it's so new that it, it transforms the moment. That's a very intellectual way of saying it really works. And why did you say yes to Saturday Night Live? It didn't have, it couldn't have had any reputation. Uh, Actually, David Geffen, <laughs> David was my agent at the time, and so it probably would have come through <laughs> David. Well, he okay. was fresh out of the mailroom when mm -hmm. we started. Um, oh, no, wait a minute. David wasn't my agent then, or was he? He you know, could have I been 75, remember. 75. Yeah, he could have been my agent then. But he was my agent um, with Society's Child for part of it. I can't remember. But anyway, it would have come from probably Sony, which was then CBS, um, because I was on tour, and it was pretty brutal touring. Mm -hmm. I was on tour for three years, and I remember that the CBS jet had to fly me back, their private jet, because I was working in California, so they flew me back on a midnight flight, to do the show and I couldn't rehearse because I had concerts the day before so or the days before so I walked in cold that afternoon oh my. Uh, and I had strep throat and my fever was 104 and I walked in cold and everybody was really nice I remember that and I remember walking up to this paper mache mountain and seeing I think a frog talking to a pig or something the Muppets the, and Muppets, the Muppets and yes. thinking oh god what have I gotten myself into and the then Muppets were also part of the original Saturday Night Live. That's right. Yes. That's right. But they were adult Muppets. They were weird. But Muppets. I didn't know when I was looking at this thing, I thought I was hallucinating <laughs> because I didn't know Jim Henson was behind it. <laughs> and then this huge, tall guy stepped out from behind it, and I thought, oh, they're puppets. It's okay. Yeah. Um, I remember that we took the private jet back, and there was a storm over the Rockies, so that was a little scary. And I got into New York sometime that morning, Probably grabbed a couple of hours sleep, went straight to the studio, did a quick camera run through, and then we were on. Did you sense any impact afterwards? 
um, or was it so early in the SNL? It was so that early. It just sort of. Nobody would have thought. In fact, I was, <laughs> to name drop, I was talking with Tina Fey a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and we were both saying, you <laughs> Under know. Under what circumstances? Um, it was actually about another thing entirely that I can't go into. Oh, good. But I hope you do it. Whatever <laughs> no. it is, whatever it is, I, I hope, hope it you works do it. out. Okay. Um, but I was saying, you know, none of us had a clue. I mean, Lauren didn't know. Nobody had a clue. You weren't thinking of writing a musical, are you? Boy, that would, that would be a life goal, wouldn't that? That would be great. You would be I would so love to write a musical. Well, hello. Yeah, if you're listening, I'd love yes. to write a musical, yeah. Okay. No, that's been a goal since I was two and a half and saw a run through of Oklahoma. I that's see true. absolutely no reason. Yeah, there's just the question of a book and funding and getting it. Well, yeah, okay, out. those so reasons. There's a minor details. Yes, yeah, the money and the idea. Yeah, the money and the idea, <laughs> yeah. and, yeah, and the, the group. I was really glad when Cindy Lauper won all those awards, too. Um, I mean, first of all, she had a great group mm -hmm. around her. That was an amazing group. But I thought, oh, Broadway is finally open again to singer-songwriters. That's pretty great. Well, I hope you do something like that. No, I All hope right. so, too. Uh, th this has blown by this time. <laughs> the, the last question Phase two. is uh, I want to get people to come to your seminars. And, uh, but as an example, what would you tell yourself? 13, 14 today, <laughs> um, you know, in terms of uh, with what's out there to be encouraging rather than discouraging about how to compose music, how to record or get your music out there or just to get that part of you out somehow. What, what can you say? Well, for starts, I wouldn't limit it to music. I would talk about being an artist. Okay. And I would say two things. I would say, first of all, trust your instincts. You have to listen. You have to listen to everything and everyone. But trust your instincts because if you create something and put it out there and it goes against your instincts and it fails, you've got nothing. If it's a success, you're stuck with it for your entire life. But if you go with your instincts, failure or success, you'll have something you're proud of. So that's really important, and that's a hard lesson to learn when everybody around you, managers and agents and friends and everyone is yammering at you what you should do. Uh, the other is, and this is going to sound really ugly, uh, trust no one. Because the truth is... The, it all boils down to the X-Files? It all boils down, and it always <laughs> comes back to the X-Files. <laughs> Scully and Mulder. Because at the end of the day... Any manager who says you're more important to them than they are to themselves is very not well. Any audience member who says that they can't live without you is not well. This is not brain surgery. This is changing the world. This is making the world a better place. But you have to understand your place in it. And if you think that your place is somewhere where you keep handing people a blank check, that will come back at you in spades and not in a good way. Trust your instincts. Trust your talent. All right. That's great free advice. Yeah, yo. Yeah. And then the rest of it is, is it Saturday? Uh, it is. On Saturday, I'm doing one workshop on storytelling, um, basically n dealing with fear and living your life out loud. And then another, s another is about archetypes and songwriting, which I think is going to probably morph into more questions and answers about being an artist. It's, I just find that talking about being a songwriter, there's a point where you're only talking to other songwriters, and it's boring. But if you're talking to artists and doctors and lawyers and teachers and students, then it becomes a whole bigger world, and it's much more interesting. Come because I'm interesting. And also come on Friday night. Uh, well, concert. Friday night is a different thing. Yeah, Friday night will be a fun concert because I haven't done a concert in a year, so that should be, that should be pretty interesting. Well, I'm looking forward to everything. Thanks. I oh, really enjoyed this. It's a joy. All right, we're done. Awesome. Right, thank you.
missing you but nothing like before summer in Jazz in Central Park Chocolate kisses Stolen in the dark Rooftop romance Sugar by the shore Summer in What a time we have Gone from good to bad Remember how we would strut And promenade the strand The men wore hat in hand Fifth Avenue was oh so grand the heat came rising through the street when sin and sidewalk meet you dance into a very different band oh man Memories more precious than forever. You'll always be my Coney Island heart. Summer in New York. Summer in. Seventeen, that love was meant for beauty queens, and high school girls with clear skin smiles who married young and then retired. The Valentines I never knew, the Friday night charades of youth were spent on one more beautiful. Seventeen, I learned the truth. And those of us with rabbit faces, lacking in the social graces, desperately remained at home, inventing lovers on the phone, who called to say, "Come dance with me." And all it seems at seventeen, a brown eyed girl in hand me downs, whose name I never could pronounce, said, Pity, please, the ones who serve, cause they only get what they deserve. And the rich relation to Town queen marries into what she needs with a guarantee of company and haven for the elderly. 
So remember those who win the game, lose the love they sought to gain. In debentures of quality, in dubious integrity, their small town eyes will gape at you in dull surprise. When payment due exceeds accounts received. Seventeen. To those of us who knew the pain, the Valentines that never came, and those whose names were never called, were choosing sides for basketball. was long ago and far away, and the world was younger than today, when dreams were all they gave for free, to ugly duckling girls like me. We all play the game, and when we dare, we cheat ourselves at solitaire. On the phone, repenting other lives unknown. They call and say, Come on, dance with me. Love of vague obscenities, and ugly girls like me at 17.